breaking news. I'm like an atheist. Yeah, I don't believe in God. Even the Holy Spirit can like yeah. fucking uh, uh, suck it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I'm you know, die. I'm gonna rot. Oh yeah, yeah, like rot with worms crawling up my anus and like fucking giving me a hard on and shit. Wow, oh, sex yeah. in the butt. Oh yeah, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I'll eat pork all the I time. Eat babies. Oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> to us, the American dream is nothing. To us, the American dream is nothing. A middle school in suburban D.C. has instituted a no-touching rule. Now, this rule applies to any sort of physical contact that could possibly transpire at any point during the day. And it includes, you know, even handshakes and high fives. My friends are over there. Now, middle school kids touching, you know, is pretty gross. Yeah, it's kind of like old people touching. But, you know, some of you may know that the average American gets more physical contact and affection from any one of his pets or from any of the people in his life. Yeah, it's not surprising either. You know, you see those rough and tough guys with their big dogs. They get a little, they get a little naughty. Yeah, it's definitely some heavy petting going on. Yeah, but if you were to do that to, you know, Susie Cream Cheese in the seat next to you, you'd have a heavy lawsuit on your hands. I mean, maybe possibly a pair of hairless genitals. But, you know, even still, I mean, like, you know, there are some good, you know, I mean, the, you know, a middle schooler, you know, needs a little bit of human contact to keep from going completely insane. You know, just like a little friendly high five, you yeah, know, you walking down. Slip a little dime bag in there. Damn straight, you know, maybe if you want to, you know, boost your uh, math grade with a little extracurricular Ooh, nose dive. Geometry up. Or maybe, you know, just, you know, your first awkward hand job of your lifetime, yeah. you know, before I mean, the age of 17. Right, anything that would facilitate you getting close and starting a YouTube news show together. You can't believe the hype, and no one loves you for these 10,000 lies, I hope to realize one truth. This week on Servicing the Public, we have two very special stories to bring to you. The first comes from across the pond in jolly old England, where lawmakers are attempting to crack down on date rape, something which should be done when it can be done legitimately by ruling that if a woman is intoxicated, she is legally incapable of giving consent. Incapable. That means, you know, if she's had a few to take the edge off, and she has a nice attractive slur in her voice, and she says... Kobe, I have full mental capabilities, and I am consenting to have a sexual escapade with you tonight. You know, I want to have sex with you. I want to. Yes, yes, yes. All night long. Still in the morning, you gotta hop, you know, the next cargo ship back to the States and get the fuck out of there. I mean, and think about if this law was applied in the United States. I don't know about y'all, but my conception, probably Kobe's conception, and most certainly the cameraman's conception, isn't that right, cameraman? would be considered date rape if this law was applied. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is it gives people the power to just call rape when they just, you know, really regret what they did. Like when you wake up next to Montgomery or Dexter or Henry or Sebastian or uh, Graham. I mean, really, like, and the funny thing is this law doesn't even really apply to men from what we can tell. I mean, you know, if I was drunk, you know, and I had a sexual liaison with someone that I super duper regretted. You know, I couldn't, you know, I have no legal recourse where it is that right. she would. I mean, imagine that in court, you know. I, you know, I was, I was drunk and I might have said yes, but I really didn't want her to blow me. They wouldn't say that was rape, but... It was. It was. Anyway, in other news, uh, a vibrating condom is causing fierce debate in India over whether or not it is a sex toy, which, you know, are universally banned, or whether or not it is a form of birth control. Right. Now, I mean, like, like, I would definitely have a fierce debate with my lover if, you know, she bought me some condoms and they vibrated. But these ones are supposed to. It says it all over the packaging. I mean, there's no mystery there. I mean, really, one of the things we really, you know, try to get down to business about on the new low is the is how people set their priorities. You know, I mean, fuck it. If you are, you know, in a country where most of the people are below the poverty line and the Black Plague is still icing motherfuckers to this day, don't you think you have better shit to concern yourselves with than whether or not a condom goes like this before it catches your fucking seed? News from somewhere else. In news from somewhere else, creationism science is spreading throughout Europe. The Council of Europe member states have responded with a report that says the spread of creationism could be a threat to human rights. Damn. Straight. I mean, creationism is a fucking virus. Over here in the U.S., lawmakers are really not so sure about what to do with this uh, science. Some say that we should teach the controversy, that we should perhaps give separate but equal time to both uh, 
rival theories. Yeah, we know how well separate but equal works. But every other new law, we have one thing to say to that, which is, uh, blow us. Because as soon as, uh, creation scientists manage to actually produce an independent critical study, analysis, hypothesis, investigation, fucking experiment for the love of Christ in heaven, or maybe actually, you know, write a book without, you know, black hole-sized errors of facts just marring every single lifeless page, maybe only then would we might want to consider, you know, putting creation science perhaps in the appendix of a science textbook, you know, somewhere along the lines. In a Catholic school, at that. Yeah. In other news from somewhere else, about two weeks ago, Britain made Salman Rushdie a knight. Salman Rushdie is an excellent author who wrote The Satanic Verses, which many consider blasphemous against Islam. <clears throat> now, they issued a fatwa, which is a death threat, and he went into hiding for about ten years. He's just only recently, in the last few years, emerged and made a knight. Now, Iran, about two weeks ago, when they found out about this, many Iranians were irate about this, you know, probably the same guys that were trying to fucking ice him during those ten years, and now the rest of Iran, the protests have just, have just escalated, you know, because apparently these people don't have anything better to do than take to the streets with signs about some dead dude. No, 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 wait, no, wait, Salman Rushdie's, in fact, still alive. No, I mean Muhammad. Burn. There's no God question, just a God delusion. Just a God delusion. Welcome to God is Mad Dead. You may have thought that geocentrism died a couple hundred years ago with the end of the Ptolemaic cosmo cosmological system as an accepted scientific theory. But the fact of the matter is that it hasn't. Even today, in the thoughts of minds, of almost all religious people, geocentrism holds, uh, holds true more than any other theory. The title of this week's argument is the argument from incredulous narcissism, which is that, and the basic premise is that, religious people are incredibly narcissistic in how they view man's thoughts and actions in relation to the humongous universe that envelops them. The basic premise is that the universe is humongous. Really, it consists of billions of stars and galaxies, and has been around for billions of years, and even on the planet Earth alone, contains billions of individual organisms. However, theism effectively posits that the whole of creation is just kind of like a stage. It's a multiple choice test, wherein the only answer that really matters is what God you accept. You know, who you say your Lord and Savior is. You know, I mean, think about that for a second. They believe that everything around us, all of the rocks, organisms, birds, bees, fish, planets, whatever, are just a backdrop. They're just sort of a stage wherein we can say yes or no. To me, that's just pretty silly. So the next time a theist talks about God's marvelous creation, or God's excellent plan for the entire universe, Ask them, wholeheartedly, who do you think you are? I mean, because really, who do they think they are? I mean, they think that every time they think a sinful thought, every time they masturbate to an attractive woman they've seen, every time they've had angry thoughts toward their neighbor, every time they've forgotten, you know, to tithe or give alms or any other number of sins, that the universe literally shakes in agony. I think a much more reasonable alternative is that the universe really does not give a fuck about us, and that we have to do our best to kind of make our stay here as pleasant as possible. Anyway, so that's the argument from incredulous narcissism. Hope it goes to good use. God is mad dead, kids. Beast of the Beast of the Beast of the Week. This week's beast is Walt fucking Whitman. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard about this dude, but he m invented free verse because he fucking felt like it. He went and served in the Civil War, you know, as a medic, helping wounded soldiers because he fucking felt like it. He didn't get married because he felt like it. He didn't hold a steady job for years at a time because he fucking felt like it. He died when he felt like it, he wrote when he felt like it, he drank when he felt like it, and he maybe fucked when he felt like it. Who knows? Fucking beast. Check him out, kids.